Okay, it's about 434. So we'll go ahead and get started. Again, I'm Lakita. I'm the program manager at the Farmers of Color Network at RAFI. I'm so excited to be sharing this information. A big important pillar of what we do is making sure that the farmers that we work with have as much information as possible to access resources um, that we can. And so um, welcome, thank you. Um, again, we are recording today's session. Any questions that you have, please put them in the chat and we will have a chance to have those questions asked and answered. And for any we don't get to today, we'll send out a little bit later with the recording. Um, what I will share or, or at least encourage you to do if you're not already, um, subscribe to the Farmers of Color Network's newsletter. It's where we announce events such as this, uh, any other important information or resources that are available to you, and just so that you know, you know what's going on with your fellow farmers. Um, if you're not subscribed already, you can just send me a quick email at lakita at rafiusa.org. That's L-A-K-E-T-A at rafiusa.org. Um, so today I'm going to, you're going to be hearing from uh, Lisa Mish, who is Rafi's program manager and among several other functions that she uh, does at Rafi, um, she oversees our USDA funded programs. Um, so she's a wealth of knowledge. And at this juncture, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Lisa to get started. Great, thank you, Lakita. Um... As she mentioned, my name is Lisa Mish, and I'll be sharing about the Pandemic Response and Safety Grant uh, this afternoon. Um, and, and I'll be referring to it as PRS quite a bit, uh, so that's what it stands for. Um, this grant program came out of a series of feedback and comments that the USDA um, requested in terms of how COVID relief programs were going. Um, and based on that, they created this grant program to provide relief to groups that either missed out on other types of relief programs or they really weren't in alignment with other types and, and they missed out kind of on the full um, relief that was being provided. Um, so in terms of the purpose of the grant program, um, it is to provide grants to specialty crop producers and processors, other select producers, meat and other processors, distributors, and farmers markets to respond to coronavirus, including for measures to protect workers. So that's the verbatim um, purpose that USDA has provided. Um, the funding for this program came from CARES Act funding from, I believe it's January of this year, uh, and includes 650 million. I'll mention that if anyone's on the call today uh, and is involved with commercial fisheries or seafood, there is a separate PRS grant program for that industry and it's being um, administered through state block grants. Um, so it's, it's gonna be um, contacting state agriculture departments in order to access those funds. Um, but we'll be talking about the regular PRS grant today. So the basic logistics of this grant, it's between a $1,500 and $20,000 grant to cover costs incurred due to COVID between January 27th of 2020 and December 31st of 2021. So a two year window. Um, the application period opened October 6th and it's open for 45 days. And so it closes November 22nd. There's been some indication that um, there'll be a second round of funding. So um, that may be the case, but for this first round to get um, grant funding as soon as, as possible, November 22nd is your deadline. Um, and then I was also gonna mention, in terms of the go-to place for information, it's gonna be um, the Pandemic Response and Safety Grant website on um, USDA's website. Um, oh, and I'll mention this is also a grant program that's being administered through the Agricultural and Marketing Service, which is abbreviated as, as AMS. So if, if I refer to AMS, that's what I mean. Um, so this is the website that's gonna be really useful in terms of um, finding information about eligibility. This is where you actually apply. Um, so I'll refer to this a couple of times during the presentation. Um, 
and we'll, we'll also include that uh, link either in the chat or in follow-up materials um, so you can find that. But that's, um, that's gonna be a really go-to place for information. Let me get back here. And before I go further, I'll also mention that I'll be going over quite a bit of information and mentioning web pages and links. Um, so we're recording the webinar and we'll send that out. Um, I'll also include a PDF of the slides here um, and any relevant website links um, and any questions that we don't answer. So um, if you didn't quite um, catch something this first time around, um, we'll be sending follow-up information about that. Okay, so the big question is what do the funds cover? And this is a really text heavy slide, but this is the exact uh, wording that is used on AMS's website. Um, and it's really the, the language that they're falling back on in terms of clarification about specific situations. These are the six categories that they're looking at for um, activities that would be covered by the grant. Um, so I'll just, I'll walk through each one um, briefly and then on the next slide, maybe get into some more specifics of how might that apply to you. Um, the first category is workplace safety and definition of this being implementing workplace safety measures to protect workers against COVID. They use the examples of um, you know, purchasing PPE, masks, uh, thermometers, sanitizer, hand washing stations, um, or installing uh, air filters or getting signage that encourages social distancing, anything that's really protecting your workers. Um, and that includes yourself on the farm or in, in different market channels. The next category is market pivots. And I think this is uh, a particularly good category for kind of being creative and, and different costs that might be connected with your operation. Um, definition being implementing market pivots to protect workers against COVID. And they use the example of developing an online store. Um, if you had to switch to online purchasing um, or needed to communicate different uh, market pivots. Um, but I, I, I think there are a lot of ways um, that you can include other costs that I'll, I'll mention a bit later, but anything where you had to make some sort of market channel pivot and there were costs associated with that uh, could fall under that category. Um, and that includes staff time. If staff you know, had to either be hired or uh, extend hours in order to make some of those pivots. The next category is retrofit retrofitting facilities uh, for workers and consumer safety to protect it against COVID, um, you know, different dividers or creating a walk-up window um, if you had to build different um, yeah, tables or tents in order to change your marketing style. Those could be different um, eligible costs. Transportation would be providing transportation options to maintain social distancing and worker safety, consumer safety. Um, they give an example about if you had to provide different type of transportation services for workers, or if you did something like um, offer home delivery services, um, that would fall under that category as well. And then the last two um, may not be as relevant, but worker housing would be if you were providing worker housing to protect workers against COVID and um, offered greater spaces, social distancing or opportunities for quarantining um, and medical um, health services would be, you know, if you were providing medical treatment or um, enabling for vaccinations or giving paid leave um, if someone was infected with COVID. So those, again, it's, that's a lot of information on the slide, but it's sort of the official language that the USDA is falling back on in terms of whether something is eligible or not. Okay, so this grant is not really meant to cover general farm expenses that are gonna happen in a year, but there may be ways for certain expenses to fit under the guidelines um, even still, because it's related to some sort of pivot. And so I was trying to highlight some of those on this slide, uh, the potential common scenarios um, that could apply to you. Um, for instance, I know a lot of um, farmers ended up creating some sort of online store um, in early 2020 in order to sell their products and either purchased a card reader or um, even if they had an existing site and in saw increased traffic, increased monthly fees. That sort of expense would be completely um, allowable under this grant and could be um, reimbursed for that full uh, two year period. Um, another example would be if you had any sort of packaging, labeling, material costs that changed, again, because of that market pivot. Um, you know, say you had to change to 
having kind of grab and go um, containers for foods at the farmer's market and you had different um, packaging costs for that, that could fall under um, the category. As I mentioned, also if, if you have hired labor to maybe run some of those um, home deliveries or um, you know, do extra work to maintain um, worker and consumer safety, that would be valid. Um, and if you had to increase mileage because you had to all of a sudden drive to this further away market channel, um, Again, any, anything if it's related to you know, a change you had to make because of COVID, there may be ways for that to fit under. Um, and also think about if you have any anticipated expenses for the rest of the year that could fit under those different categories. Like if you renew your online store subscription um, or if you're planning to get new signage, um, you know, get an extra order of masks, that sort of thing. Um, what it doesn't cover, it is not gonna be able to cover general farm expenses, inputs that have increased in cost because of COVID-driven supply chain issues. You know, if raw construction materials have gone up quite a bit, if you're going to be buying those materials regardless of COVID, it's not going to fit, even though um, obviously those costs have gone up quite a bit. Um, this is also, it's not going to cover expenses that got covered through other federal funding sources. Um, so if, if someone got a, PP, a PPP loan kind of early in 2020, uh, you just wanna be careful that you're not double dipping those same expenses if it was covered through a PPP loan. Um, and although it's, I believe there's still some clarification coming down from the USDA, at this point, this grant is not covering lost revenue from COVID. So if you had a farmer's market that was closed for a month and you lost sales, at this point, um, you wouldn't be kind of taking into account those expenses um, or that lost income. I'll pause there just to see if there are any questions about um, whether some costs might be allowable or not. And you can add it to the chat or come off mute um, if that's easier. Okay, um, well, if anything comes to mind, um, we'll, we'll have another opportunity to kind of answer questions later on. So please feel free to add things to the chat if it comes up. Okay, so a big part of this is being able to document the, the funding request that you might have for this application. Um, so the good news is that this application does not require you to upload upload receipts, upload all your documentation as part of the application process. It's self-certifying. Um, so you're just putting in your dollar total amount. But applicants have to be able to justify that, um, that funding request amount. Um, so necessary to maintain sufficient records and documentations showing where those different expenses came from. Um, examples they give on the website are receipts, emails showing um, distribution of different equipment or um, telling workers to, to work extra hours or divert their activities to a COVID activity, um, photographs of market pivots, I think like social media posts um, would also be, would also work if you had any sort of note taking or sales records. Um, this is an area where you, know, you can get creative about how to show that you know, this expense did occur on your farm. Um, and it's just important to keep that on record for at least three years is what they um, instruct. And that is in the case of any sort of audit that might happen. Um, I haven't heard any sort of indication that there's gonna be a widespread spot check for this, but um, important to have those on, on record. Um, and then I guess I'll say if you are thinking about covering um, you know, a worker's time or your own time, um, for additional COVID activities. Um, just want to be judicious on you know, the documentation you have to show that additional time. So if you have some, any sort of documentation about you know, the basis of pay that you might receive um, or yeah, amount of time you've spent on these different activities, those, those could all be put together um, to justify that expense. Um, but you know, I wouldn't 
advocate for just requesting $5,000 for your time without having that um, documentation to back it up. So that's, um, that's kind of a big piece of this uh, application process is thinking through what are all those different categories? Do I have expenses there that would apply? How can I back this up um, for this time period? All right, thinking about how to apply, there's three basic steps to it. Um, there's determining your eligibility, registering for a DUNS number, and then completing the online application before November 22nd. In terms of eligibility, I, I read through some of those different types of eligible entities on that first slide I shared. Um, but generally, the, this first round of funding is focused on small specialty crop and livestock producers, farmers markets, and small business food processors. So I'm guessing that's most of you that are on the call today. Um, in addition to fitting under that category, um, they're asking for each applicant to find their appropriate NAICS code, um, which is a six digit code. It's through the census.gov um, that describes your particular industry. Um, so I have a snapshot of that PRS website here. And there's a tab at the top for eligibility um, where they describe a little bit more about how to find that next code. And if it's, they have some examples listed on their website, but then, you know, they say to go to this www.census.gov slash snakes to find the exact code by searching um, by the keyword. And on this next slide, I show some screenshots from the census.gov site where you can go, you type in a keyword. I just typed in watermelon here. Um, and then it will show you search results of watermelon farming is 111219. Um, so they get very specific by different um, different types of commodity crops. There's like dry potato farming, there's strawberry farming. So if you are someone that produces 50 different things, um, they're asking you to think about your primary activity um, and just go off of that. Um, so there is you know, a very good chance that anything that um, you know, a small specialty crop or livestock producer is gonna be covered, but there may be a little bit of searching just to find the right code within um, census.gov. So that would be um, one of the first things I would um, encourage folks to do is go to that website and see which of those industry codes are gonna be most relevant uh, to your business. The next step is registering for the DUNS number. The DUNS number is another six digit uh, number and it's identification code that USDA uses in their application process. It's a free registration, um, free registration process, but it does take five business days for it to be approved. So this is something to um, yeah, pay attention to, not wait until you know a couple days before the deadline because um, you will need that to fill out and submit the application. I have a link here where you can go to check if you have an existing DUNS number. Um, Maybe you ended up registering for one of the past, um, so that's, that's the reason of searching for it. Um, but if you don't, that's also the website to go to to start the registration process. Um, and again, I'll include that link on the follow-up materials. Um, but for the registration process, you're going in there and you're just filling out your business information. So it's either gonna be you know, the full business name, or if you're a sole proprietorship, it's going to be your full legal name. Um, and then to, kind of, um, to confirm that business information, the other part of the registration process is uploading two documents to support that information. Um, and they have a list of different file formats that are accepted for uploading. They don't have PDF for some reason, which I find odd. So, um, you know, it might be easiest to take a picture and upload. Um, to that portal instead. But they have an, uh, examples of different accepted documents. The important thing is that the documents contain your legal business name or your legal full name, current physical address, um, yeah, name and current physical address is the important part. But examples of accept accepted documents, um, you know, for anyone that's on the phone, that's articles of incorporation, receipt of filing, taxpayer identification number, um, EIN confirmation letter, doing business as name, certificate filing, lease agreement, mortgage, phone, internet utility bill, home insurance, insur homeowner's insurance, um, you know, invoice from a third party, those type of documents. Um, so 
fairly simple registration process to go ahead and get started, um, but you want to do it in advance. And, and USDA is actually advising people to submit the registration 10 days, 10 business days before the close of the program. So that would be November 8th. Um, so that's that's a good deadline to you know keep in mind if you think you would like to apply. Once what happens once you submit this request is that you'll be notified either by the email or the phone number you provided in the um, application of when you receive your your DUNS number and what number that is. All right, and then the third step is to complete the online the online application, um, which again is that main. Um, website that I showed earlier. And to do to complete the application, you'll need that DUNS number, your NAICS code, and then your total request amount, um, which is backed up by the documentation that you have on file. I took a couple screenshots of what the application looks like, but um, again, you can go to the website and, and see that directly. Um, you know, at the top of it, you're putting in your DUNS number, um, your legal business name, Again, if you're a sole proprietorship, you're just going to put your full legal name. Um, address, eligible industry, that's where you're going to put um, your NAICS code. Um, in case anyone is here and um, you know, is representing a farmer's market, farmer's markets themselves don't have a NAICS code, but there's a specific um, option in there for farmer's markets. Um, then for applicant type, probably most of you are going to be small business. Um, and then there's a space for putting a primary contact and a secondary contact, and that's relevant. And then the second page is where you're putting in your funding request. And you're just putting in the total amount within those six categories that we went through. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll give an example of those eligible activities again in column A. Column B is where you're putting in the totals. Um, Column C is actual costs incurred, which is optional. Um, and that, I think it's there, you know, in case maybe you had expenses that totaled up to $45,000. Well, this grant only covers $20,000. So you could have something that totals $20,000 in column B. But if you want to, you know, further show USDA that you had costs that went above that, then you could put the other $25,000 in column C. But it's, you can leave it blank. Um, there, there's no penalty or um, you know, advantage for filling that in. Um, so yeah, you'll fill in column B. It will give you an error message if it's if the total is either below 1500 or, or over 20,000. So you're definitely within that um, grant range. And then there's a couple of check boxes at the bottom of the screen attesting that you know, this information is correct um, and that you're not a robot and then you can submit. Let's see, I'll go one more slide and then pause if there are any questions. Um, so once the application is submitted, you'll receive a confirmation email with a reference ID number. You'll want to keep that on file just in case. Uh, right now, the USD is estimating that payments will be issued within seven to eight weeks after the deadline closes. So it's, it's likely that any payments will be coming in 2022 and not this year. Um, this is a non-competitive grant program, um, or it, it's a it's a it's not a first come first serve grant program. So um, with things like if, if you if you were looking at you know CFAT program earlier, uh, applications that came in were reviewed as they came in and were approved and payments issued as they came in. Um, so there was always the chance of not getting funds if you applied late late in the game and all the funds had been expended. Um, for this. You can apply, all the applications are being received until November 22nd. Once that passes, they'll review applications for, you know, that they meet eligibility um, and that the rest of the application is completely, um, um, it's accurately completed. If that's the case, it will be eligible for funding. So in the situation where there are funding requests that exceed that $650 million, which is um, available for the funding, there may be the um, option for the USDA to prorate those payments so that everyone who had a valid application does receive a payment, um, but it's going to be you know, prorated so it fits within that $650 million. Um, 
I was on a webinar the other day where they said they'd only received about $30 million worth of um, requests at this point. So it seems unlikely to me, but um, that's something they have communicated. Um, let me pause again. Are there any questions about the application process, the DUNS number, the NAICS code? There were two that came in the chat about um, what can be paid for. One is what about gas cord cards that were provided to volunteers um, during COVID for extra delivery support? Dominique asked. And then um, Victoria asked about um, additional expenses to expand outdoor seating for social distancing. Um, well, for the uh, expanding social distancing, um, yes, that, that would be in line with it. Um, can you say again, what would the, was it gap? What was yeah. the first one? Gas cards for volunteers who were yes. delivering during COVID. Yes, that would be eligible as well because um, I'm assuming that um, you know, weren't doing home deliveries um, or home deliveries were a change that you made because of COVID um, as with expanding outdoor seating. So both of those would be in line. So Lisa, Stephen Thomas here. I'm just going to comment on the, the, the number you said they had in the pool of money and how and if how little has been kind mm. of, I'm telling you, my experience has been all the things you described to get online, to verify, get to undone, all that are like huge barriers for some folks. Mm. So money sits there, but we have hurdles just like we did in early COVID on how to sign up for a vaccine. I wonder to what extent there's technical support needed as well moving forward. This deadline is right around the corner, so it is what it is. But I'm curious if anyone on this call sees the online process a burden. I may be wrong. Maybe everybody here has got that experience. But I'm seeing people really struggle with that. Their paper, getting their paper ready. Hello? Uh, yes. Stephen, to your point, uh, you probably were reading my mind because my question was going to be, will Rathia provide some kind of pre-submittal technical assistance review so that if applicants are ready to send their documents in, maybe there's a firewall uh, at RAFIA where individuals would submit their paperwork first prior to submitting it to USDA. And they formalize, I'll phrase it like that, I've worked with USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service and the one thing you do not want to do is submit a document that is not up to par, first impressions. So that, uh, Stephen, I, I appreciate your question. Dan, you know, the, 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 it generates so much frustration when they go back and back and forth and back and forth. So you're right, if Rafia could say, we're doing a pre-proposal a pre review with a whole committee like this, fix this, fix that, fix the other thing, we can, we can like crowdsource solutions because the bureaucracy kicks you out on an algorithm it's not like a human being's looking at it and say, i'm going to call dan and tell him to fix this it's a problem and we need this administration to know that's a problem if they want these dollars to get in the hands of the people that need it they have to provide some technical support for all the bureaucracy they want us to go through for their accountability i get it but people need help Somebody put in the chat, they've been waiting for their DUNS number for two weeks. I'd be, yeah, I'd be curious um, to follow up with someone on that because, um, the, the, yeah, the, there's been a particular portal created to expedite those that are applying for this. Um, so, yeah, I'd be very curious to follow up with them on that. Um, to your point about, um, you know, kind of the online application, I think one of the the intentions behind having an online application for this particular program is because there was also barriers that people ran into with um, other programs that were administered by local county offices where then farmers had to deal with you know local agents and so there was an attempt to also try to you know provide something that was a direct application um, but there's there's their own barriers that come with that. I am going to talk about um, you know where to go to for help just on this next slide, um, and then also there was a point about um, pre-approval with some help from Rafi, um, and I do have some more information about that. But um, there really isn't 
documents to submit for the, the actual application for this grant. Um, again, because you're just putting in um, total dollar amounts. Um, but I think you know where Rafi could provide help is if you know if you wanted to um, check if you know certain expenses would be allowable, um, if the documentation you have would be sufficient um, to get kind of a second opinion on that. Um, I think we'd be happy to do, and I, I can you know, provide some more emails on that next page. Um, but yeah, there, there is the very real part of like needing a DUNS number, finding that NAICS code. Um, it's, it's frustrating because I know like there's been so many conversations within um, the AMS agency that they've designed this program so it's accessible. It really simplified the process and it even still, um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't always get all the way there. I think it's I think it's great. I mean, think about if we were here right now and Dan was up and we literally put his application in right now together. Mm. I mean, some some kind of crowdsourcing like that may not need it for everybody. I'm sure there's some experts out here who can do it on their own, but I am telling you the government needs to know, even in the name of simplifying, there are challenges. And Rafia, as an intermediary, we trust you. We're coming to you because we trust you that this is the place where we can fix that and bring everybody's capabilities up because the future will be more of these online applications, more of these kinds of things. So I'm glad that they brought us to the mothership instead of the local. They've done that also in the SBA, the Small Business Administration. Now you don't have to go through the banks. The Small Business Administration itself will make the loan because they realizing that somehow these applications aren't coming in. So I like that part, but there's still a, hump and Rafa could get us over it because we trust you. It's good to hear. And I saw Dan give a thumbs up for us submitting an application for him. So let's see. Um, Hello, Lisa. Hello. Yes. Welcome back. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Yeah, I, 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 I want to, I'm asking a question. Can um, I go to a lot of farmer market and is there is it, can cost be included to improve the vehicle I take to the farm market? Uh, things like better sanitation, uh, screening uh, from 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 everybody, and that sort of stuff be included in in this project in this grant. For farmers market costs, I think if you are if you were driving your your same vehicles to the market. Um, it was the same sort of mileage, same sort of costs, regardless of COVID happening. I, I wouldn't say that's um, an allowable expense, but if your farmer's market, um, you know, was all of a sudden giving you the safety protocols of wiping down your table more, of, you know, adding another kind of buffer space, of having hand sanitizer available, um, wearing masks, those additional expenses that you had would be allowable. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, well, as I mentioned, I'll just I'll talk about where to find help. Um, so that that first stop is the PRS website. They have quite a few um, frequently asked questions, um, links to different places. That's where you can link to the the Duns registration, um, the online application. Um, so I, I would check that out and just explore that space a bit. Um, the next place to go is uh, they have set up a hotline and an email directly to provide technical assistance on um, how to apply and how to get applications through. Um, the email, you, know, you can send that uh, a question to them whenever. The hotline is staffed Monday through Friday, nine to nine. Um, I've used both of those resources uh, last week when I was trying to get some clarification questions and they they are responsive. Um, I think I got an email within 20 minutes of, of sending them one. So um, those are definitely options and they have um, operators that can sp uh, speak in Spanish and work with you there. So um, I haven't gotten confirmation, but I am I'm curious if they would also be able to help submit an application um, if someone doesn't have access to the internet. So that's not something I'm, I'm sure about, but um, the hotline is there to help um, people apply. Um, and then in terms of other help from Rafi, um, we have a farmer hotline, which um, 
folks can call if they're having issues um, with the application um, or you know figuring out allowable expenses. There's also, um, I believe both Lakita and Sabine have offered to help um, with, with some of that on their sites as well, which um, maybe they can add emails into the chat um, or yeah. Um, so if you have specific issues running to, especially if you're, again, like if you're not getting a DUNS number within five business days, please let us know because we can um, follow up with folks in, in DC and see what might be happening. Um, if you're running into issues or not getting clear answers from the AMS hotline, please let us know. Um, you know, this, this program was designed to help farmers that weren't able to get previous aid. So we wanna make sure that it's working um, within the short window. Um, so please um, be in touch if there are um, issues that come up. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll pause again if there's any other questions or comments that have come up. Okay, well, wonderful. I mean, that was the, the information to go over today. I think um, you know, for those that feel like this would be a good application to apply for, first stop will be um, checking out that DUNS registration process, finding that NAICS code and thinking about your, your funding request and whether it's gonna be in that 1500 to 20,000 range. Um, and, and I will follow up likely tomorrow morning with all those different resources um, and um, yeah, and links and, and contact information for additional help. Uh, Lakita, is there anything else you wanted to highlight? Um, just to, first of all, thank you for, you know, sharing that wealth of information, Lisa. Um, uh, and to just piggyback on what you're saying about the importance of sharing with us, any glitches, any difficulties you're having that is very important for us to have as our team um, kind of, you know, gets in gear to support um, your applications and to help troubleshoot or find out information about wherever there might be a snag so that we can, um, again, as Lisa was saying, the whole point of this grant funding was to um, give a greater opportunity for folks who may not have been able to access it during the first round. So that'll be very important information for us to have. And um, please do share this information. Again, a link will go out with this recording, share it with uh, other farmers in your community um, who could benefit from this information. And uh, we appreciate you all being on this webinar today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.